and welcome to Barn Blog Solo. And today I'm going to talk about why there probably aren't going to be any good presidents from the standpoint of progressive liberalism or socialism in the near future. And this is not just about anti-electoralism. In fact, some of what I would propose uh, is would require electoral strategies, but at a much more granular level than most socialists seem to be willing to do and would require massive amounts of infrastructure timing and coordination to build, which is why no one really wants to do it. But before we get to that point, we need to talk about why I think this is a problem. One of the fundamental ironies of the imperial presidency, a term I used to hear libertarians use before a lot of them became Trumpist, was that the putting more and more power into the executive, which theoretically is the branch of government concerned with law enforcement, all right, not the creation of policy, but the maintenance of policy and the enforcement of popular will through deliberative representative democracy. Now, I have tons of problems with all those categories, but this is the way things are supposed to work. Through the 20th century, we have seen the abrogation of Congress's, um, and in many parliaments actually, of handling social policy that could be politically divisive, um, not through statute, uh, but through court rulings and through the executive. But there's always been a limit to this. And this limit was in the movement made during most of the 19th and 20th century to make monetary policy, the, the actual construction of money and its maintenance, non-political, right? This is something modern monetary theorists and power law of values, and even Marxists have pointed out as a fundamental contradiction that the maintenance of monetary policy is outside of the realm of democratic input. While fiscal policy can be decided upon by Congress, fear of early 20th century hyperinflation led people to move more and more power into private hands. Effectively, the bank is for private bourgeois parties. And I, I think it's no accident in a lot of ways. I don't think it was conscious, but that like the celebration of the primary proponent of this kind of move to federal power, which is highly centralized and yet highly privatized, highly anti-democratic, was Hamilton. And this became the figure of American politics in the last 20 years. Thank you, Lynn, Manuel, Miranda. But we have to look at the fact that since the Roosevelt's and the progressive movement and the crises of early entrepreneurial capitalism, and I'm going to use that as a kind of phase, all right? Now, we know that no capital was ever truly laissez-faire. The construction and maintenance of, of markets has always been done by some public entity, all right? be that a religious industry or a government or a state or a nation state. And yes, those are all different things. But the maintenance and regulation of that capital was very, you know, outside of maintaining the markets and ensuring monetary transactions and contracts were actually obeyed. The law was largely out of it. And taxation practices were, were, actually largely based on tariffs and, and club fees. So, you know, not anything like progressive income tax or anything like that. There's a, a bunch of reasons for this change and it's beyond, and, the, and there's not one settled narrative even amongst mainstream economists. And definitely when you include quote heterodox economists, so Marxist, modern monetary theorists, post Keynesians, um, other kinds of, of left economists, you'll get different answers to how this scenario developed about how we fund public goods and what taxation is actually even for, right? 
Is it for the maintenance of inflation? That's kind of the Keynesian and to a lesser degree MMT answer. Is it for the funding of public services and goods through scale? That's another Keynesian answer. Um, that's the more conservative Keynesian answer, et cetera. But all this is increasingly split between the democratic imperature of fiscal policy, where we spend money, and the removal of how we regulate that money and how much of it exists and what backs it up from legislative policy. Now, sometimes powers are given to the Fed through legislative policy. You can think about TARP in the last decade. But what does this have to do with the presidency? Well, the fundamental interesting contradiction is the presidency can have the presidency seems to have trouble forgiving debts, even if they will be paid for by the government and were created by government programs and public private partnerships. Tying in the public private partnerships actually opens the way in a way that libertarians used to recognize, actually, although don't anymore, uh, are very few do. Creates a, a, a set of rent seeking incentives, whereas private actors now benefit on government policy in a very direct way and can sue the government for trying to change it. Now, this leads us to Biden today. In a reversal, the education department is excluding many student loans from relief. I'm going to put this article in thing. Both Perkins and Family Federal Education Loans are FF. EL loans were issued and managed by private banks and guaranteed by the federal government. What's the mainstay of the federal government student loan program until the FFEL loan ended in 2010? And if you have not, for some kind of loan forgiveness, consolidated these loans, I recently did so myself about three years ago, right before COVID hit, actually, um, you, you were not able to get public subsidy. This is part of the confusion about all these loan forgivenesses because the programs actually encourage people to, to deal in public-private partnerships instead of taking from the government directly. And in fact, until uh, legislation was passed during the last, uh, I think, 2007, so technically under the Bush administration, but with the Democratic Congress that changed a lot of these laws, this program was the only way. The direct, the direct loan program was actually ended for a while. On Thursday, the department changed the language to avoid lawsuit effectively. As of September 29th, borrowers with federal loans not held by the Ed Department can obtain a one-time debt relief by consolidating. Was the prior language, and then it was changed to. As of September 20, 29th, borrows with federal loans not held by the Ed Department cannot obtain one-time debt relief by consolidating loans into direct loans, thus excluding them from lawsuit and thus challenged by the courts. Now, this is not an austerity move, but it will be highly unpopular and it sacrifices tons of people and also shows how open this will be to lawsuit. Now, I want you to think about the logic of this. During the Obama administration, we discovered that an American citizen can be declared an enemy combatant and killed by drone without trial or due process of law. And yet, within America's borders, law protects capital from even the abrogation of prior federal programs. Congress would have to intervene to make this successful, which has always been my argument with the focus on the executive. We have seen time and time again that even liberal justices will limit the power of executive programs that aren't about law enforcement that should require legislative action, and yet legislative action seems more and more unlikely to happen. The trend towards Bonapartism began in the crisis of capital in the early 20th century. But the limits on the presidency have been very particular. The imperial presidency can't really mess with money. Yes, in some small ways, but if, if fundamental changes to the way we do fiscal or monetary policy are done, it cannot be done by the president's executive order, and the courts will make sure of that. Meaning, 
in very simple terms. The Bonapartist tendencies, by this I mean the tendency to put power in the executive government to bypass, you know, other deliberative bodies and to move away from a deliberative democratic imperator has actually been limited in its ability to change things domestically in the realm of, of fiscal resources in ways it hasn't been limited in the ways it can wage war or do policing that doesn't affect money. This tendency is not only in the United States, by the way. It's constitutionally written into the EU order. Right? Which is why the EU doesn't have monetary sovereignty is the EU's constitution literally made that impossible. We see similar trends in other countries, Canada being another one. And I suspect if we were to go through the executive power wrangling in most of the Latin American countries, we see a similar dynamic, although it will be more pronounced and unstable because, you know, we're not dealing with cores of capital here. This is an unpopular realization because the focus of most socialist strategy for the past, since forever, actually, even before the Bernie campaign, back when progressives were trying to run Dinesh Kucinis and stuff, was radical change through the executive because it was easier, particularly after a bunch of legal reforms happened in the 1990s that limited third-party access. But this kind of legal restraints would mean that even if you were outside of the two-party system, an executive, let's say you somehow had this miracle independent executive get top office, would still be limited by these laws unless they were willing to fundamentally destabilize the Constitution to undo them. They would have to have a constitutional crisis where force would be used against the courts. I wonder how you think that would go. And remember, in our country, the military, and a lot of people in the military do take this very seriously, pledge allegiance to the Constitution and its laws, even if that is an increasingly abstract notion of which we have not really followed um, through since the Police Powers Act, really. Um, you will notice we don't declare war anymore, yet we have police actions all the time. All right. It's 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 almost it's become such a point of pointing out in civics, the irony of like of of the fact that Congress does not really officially declare war in most cases. And thus the constitutional imperative of Congress to wage war as the deliberative body has been abrogated by giving the executive police powers has been ignored. Also, giving the executive such police powers and the power to declare war is more like the traditional, a.k.a. tyrannical executives in Europe. In short, Bonapartism, i.e. investing into a prior form of government, the emperor in the case of um, the French Republic, becomes a way to get of capitalists getting out of the crisis that their liberties do not allow them to maintain capital as the franchise is expanded. So you have to move more and more of the operations outside of the political imperator. By the way, this is not just a logic that happens on the federal of the federal government. I see this even in socialist organizations where you have non-political staff that cannot be censured by political office, right? Um, this logic pervades our society. Yet we think that we can run someone like Bernie Sanders and change this by executive order without fundamentally changing who's in the elective office, and how a lot of these laws work. And if you had the power to do that, you had the power to do a lot more than just get Bernie Sanders in office. The imperial presidency is interesting, not because of the increase in executive power, which has been intended a trend the entire of the 20th century, so much that has led to the incoherent administrations of Biden and Trump, and the barely coherent administration of a Barack Obama. No, this tendency was already codified into law with the Patriot Act, and it was a fundamental change. Another fundamental change came with the, with the expansion of the powers of the Fed and quantitative easing. 
which I don't think equaled printing money and dumping into the economy. What it actually did is more complicated than that. But now that it's over, we see its effects. There have been fundamental changes in U.S. law and the structure of life, and we have still been acting as if we could have another FDR. You will never have another FDR. Not by straight electing them into office. That period of legal history is over. Deal with where you are now. Neoliberalization has meant public-private partnerships, which means that public goods are now subject to private legal concerns. And it treats the public sector as a private actor of which a contract must be maintained. And that limits all future law. And that, by the way, is also the logic of the IMF and the World Bank courts, except, I mean, and the World Bank and any legal decisions made around trade policy, which is, by the way, proof that we do have a world order. Trade policy dominates it. Executive policy, local policy, national sovereign exception is allowed for individuals and for violence, but not for money. Think about that. 